Happy Sabbath. Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. And welcome to our Sabbath school. We're in the book of Hebrews and we're starting lesson, um, the lesson three, which is the promised son. But before we start with the lesson, I just wanted to quickly remind you and reintroduce ourselves. I'm Danielle and here's Greg and Mary. And we're happy to be together with you and uh, those that are with us presently and those that could be with us online so we can study together and get deep into the Word of God. Greg, would you mind opening with prayer for us? It would be my pleasure. Let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to come before you and to study your Word. We ask and pray and invite your Holy Spirit to be with us, to help us, to guide us, and direct us. Not only are those of us up here who are leading out in the lesson, but for all those who are listening online. May their hearts be filled with joy. May you bring them clarity through your Holy Spirit and help us to focus on the key points that you want us to take to heart and to apply in our lives and to share with others. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. And without any further delay, let's begin our study. It's an exciting lesson. We are this quarter in the book of Hebrews. And uh, Hebrews is a, a book that uh, was written sort of specifically for all the believers, but specifically to help the Jewish believers with their um, understanding of Christ. So we're excited because it is a book about Christ, our Lord. Um, but more than that, it's a book that really uh, explains the nature of Christ with the Old Testament in mind. So it's a, a deep study for us and exciting as it is. Um, as we're starting the lesson, our memory text is found in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 2, to three, 2 and 3. So let's read it together. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Now that's a power-packed text. Um, we are spend, spending this quarter, as I mentioned, in the book of Hebrews, but we're spending this week, uh, we've spent studying the first chapter of the book of Hebrews. And it's not a particularly long chapter, it's only about 14 verses, but it is really quite uh, an interesting chapter. Um, the first part, like the chapter covers the first part, like first three verses, Jesus' equality with the Father. And then in the second part of the chapter, the, his superiority over the angels. Um, it's a lesson with a lot of substance. But before we move on, I would like to kind of set the scene a, a, bit, a bit, like paint a picture. And I love the way the writer of our lesson um, began. He, be, they, he began with a, a quote from Ellen White's Desire of Ages in page 31. Now, I'm not going to quote it exactly, but he's basically saying when Adam and Eve first heard the promise, they looked for a speedy fulfillment. So let, the scene is like this. Adam and Eve have sinned, and here it is. They are being kicked out of the garden. Um, they are told what their future life under a sin-infested world is going to look like, a difficult life. Um, just all in all, not a very pretty picture, especially when they come from the beauty and peacefulness and reverie of Eden. But as, as soon as God gives them the information of what things are going to look like, he also provides them with a hope. He tells them about the fact that he's going to be sending a deliverer that was going to be incarnate and save them. But of course, at that point in time, they don't quite understand the nature of who is coming. Um, so you can imagine them preparing themselves and their first child is being born and they're wondering, is this the one that the Lord is sending to this earth? No, it isn't. And then their second son, no, it isn't. And then Abraham, he gets a promise as well uh, from the Lord. Uh, receives a promise as well, and we read in Genesis 22, 
16 through 18, the promise, and it says, and said, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you and multiply, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So there is a message of a deliverer sent, given to Abraham to be one of his descendants. But it wasn't immediate. Abraham didn't get to see it in his lifetime. David receives a promise. 2 Samuel 7, chapter 7, verses 12 to 14. When your days are fulfilled and you rest in your, with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I'll establish the thrones of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and the blows of sons of men. So there's a promise given to David. And as we know, some of the promises that we've read, we know that Jesus came from the line of David, but it wasn't in David's time. Well, God delivered on his promise in a mighty way, in a way that Adam, Eve, Abraham, and David couldn't imagine. They couldn't ever imagine that the Redeemer coming into the world would be God himself. And that's where we're heading in this lesson, how their heart will leap in their chest for joy when they will be in heaven and they will get to see history unfurled and get to review the things that we already know from the Bible and the past history. But for them, it will be, since they've already asleep, they were, fell asleep before any of these have taken place, they'll be finding out in heaven. And I'm just wondering what exactly they're going to feel mm -hmm. when they're going to realize that God came himself. Without any further delay, let's begin. We're turning over to Sunday's lesson. And Sunday is entitled, In These Last Days. Now the memory verse begins with, But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. That means God has spoken to us by his son. And we're studying about Jesus being the promised son. Now the Bible employs a few expressions about the future that have different meanings. Prophets in the Old Testament sometimes made predictions by using the phrase in the last days or in the latter days, which can be different from other Old Testament prophecies that use the phrase time of the end. So let's look at this a little deeper. The first expression in the last days or latter days comes from the Hebrew word for latter, which can mean last, end, situated or occurring nearer to the end of something rather than to the beginning, and it can mean the future. So an example of this expression being used to mean the future is in Deuteronomy 4, 25 to 30. And here Moses is telling the Israelites, when you beget children and grandchildren and have grown old in the land, and he means the promised land of Canaan, and act corruptly, and then in verse 26, that you will soon utterly perish from the land, verse 27 says, and the Lord will scatter you among the peoples. When you are in distress, verse 30 says, and all these things come upon you in the latter days. So here Moses refers to some point in the future. And history tells us 700 years after the 12 tribes crossed the Jordan River, 10 tribes were scattered. And 100 years after that, the remaining two tribes were carried off by Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon. So that's a, one example. The second expression, which is the time of the end, is used only by the prophet Daniel and refers specifically to the last days of earth's history before Christ's second coming. In fact, this expression is found only five times in the Bible in the New King James Version. And one of those quotes is in Daniel 12.4. 
But you, Daniel, this is the angel Gabriel talking to him, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. And in Hebrew, that means until the timing of this event, which is at the end of time. So let's look at God's prophecies regarding the promised son who would come in the latter days, as recorded by Moses in Numbers 24. So let's turn to Numbers 24. And here the non-Israelite prophet Balaam is with the Moabite king Balak. And the prophet says in verse 14, Come, I will advise you what this people, the Israelites, will do to your people, the Moabites, in the latter days. So he's talking about the future. So he took up his oracle and said, and we're going to jump down to verse 17, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel and batter the brow of Moab and destroy all the sons of Tumult. And Edom shall be a possession. Seir also, his enemies, shall be a possession. So Balaam is predicting God's promises that, we, that will be fulfilled in the latter days. Here it means in the future. So what are the two promises? The first one is the setting up of a king that will rise up from Jacob's lineage. The second one is that this king will destroy the enemies of God's people. So this prophecy was partially fulfilled under the rule of King David. But ultimately, who is it fulfilled by? Jesus. So was Jesus' kingdom established at his first coming? Isaiah 9, 6 and 7 says, For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his kingdom and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice, from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So there we're reading Jesus' kingdom was going to be established at his first coming. And the second promise, has Jesus defeated Satan, the enemy? Colossians 2.15 says, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Praise God. So we clearly see that Jesus fulfilled both of these promises. Now in the New Testament, the early Christian writers believed that the last days had arrived at Christ's first coming, and they would culminate in his second coming. That is why Paul could say in the memory text that God has in these last days, contrasted with the days of the prophets, Spoken to us by his son. And the Greek word here means farthest days, the final of place or time. So similarly, when Peter and the other disciples are accused of being drunk at Pentecost, Peter claims that the miracle of speaking in tongues is a fulfillment of prophecy. In Acts 2.17, he says, And it shall come to pass... In the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. This is a prophecy from Joel chapter 2, and it came to pass at the beginning of the last days. Also, when talking about Christ's incarnation, Peter wrote in 1 Peter verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 20, but Christ was manifest in these last times for you. So these last days are characterized also by scoffers who question the second coming of Christ. That's found in 2 Peter 3. The exploiting of the poor for the sake of enriching the wealthy. 
That's in James 5, 3. And the last days also are characterized by the appearance of Antichrist. And we see that in 1 John chapter 2. So in summary, we can say that the last days or latter days arrived when Jesus, the promised son, was born. We've been in the latter days since year 1 AD. And as Seventh-day Adventists, we understand we're also in the time of the end because Daniel's book was unsealed during the proclamation of the first angel's message in the 1840s. Therefore, as Christ fulfilled the promise of his first coming in the latter days, we can rest assured of his second coming at the time of the end. With that, then, I will hand it over to Dania. And, and then I'll pass it back to <laughs> Monday. Right. I'll take it from, from both of you then. <laughs> Good morning again, and happy Sabbath. Uh, Monday's lesson is titled, God Has Spoken to Us by His Son. So let's begin by opening our Bibles to the book of Hebrews. And again, you're going to hear each of us read, maybe overlap a little bit. And that's a good thing because it helps to cement what it is that God wants us to take away from his word. So if we open to Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 through 4, we'll read, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the world's who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So in the original Greek, this is written as one sentence. And it's been argued that it's perhaps one of the most beautiful in the New Testament in that its main assertion is that God has spoken through his son Jesus Christ. And keep in mind as, um, as we know in studying the Bible, the Jews in the first century AD, the word of God had not been heard for a long time in that the last revelation to be expressed in the written word of God had come through the prophet Malachi and the ministries of Ezra and Nehemiah. That was 400 years before. But now, through Jesus, God was speaking to them again. And God's revelation through Jesus is even more significant. It was superior to the prior revelations made through the prophets because Jesus is the fulfillment of what all prior prophets revealed in the Old Testament. Does that mean we do away with the Old Testament? Of course not, because if you don't know the Old Testament, then you won't know and appreciate and understand how Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament prophets. So Jesus created the heaven and the earth. Did Paul always believe this? No, we know he didn't. Uh, but once he faced that bright light, which was Jesus, on his way to Damascus, from then on, the deity of Jesus was never questioned by Paul. Paul then understood that Jesus was the fulfillment, the long prophesied Messiah spoken of by the Old Testament prophets. However, now it's possible to understand its fuller meaning, because the Son of God manifested himself by taking on our human nature. In Paul's mind, the Father's revelation through his Son Jesus provided the key to understanding the true breadth and depth of the Old Testament. And this can be somewhat analogous to a completed picture. And I like how the quarterly kind of points this out. It drew a, a very good picture for me, which was real simple. And I like that, just simple and straightforward. A completed picture. If you look at the picture on the box of a puzzle, of a jigsaw puzzle, the picture gives a clear view, a clear picture, of what all the individual pieces in the puzzle are and how they fit together so that they present a complete picture. Well, that's exactly how Jesus completes the picture of all the Old Testament prophet revelations in the Old Testament. Jesus brings light 
to the Old Testament. And I think that's pretty amazing. And Paul also tells us in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10, For it was fitting for him for whom all things and by whom all are things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of our salvation perfect through sufferings. So Jesus is the captain of our salvation. And Paul goes on to tell us in Hebrews 2 verses 17 and 18, therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren that he might be merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. That to me is amazing of what Jesus has done for us. Jesus fully took on our humanity. That he would be merciful and a faithful high priest to help us. And I love how Ellen White pens this so well. And if we look in Volume 20 of Letters and Manuscripts, number 149, paragraph 9. She puts it all together so succinctly, and I think it's really important for us to to read this and, and to digest this. But first, she quotes Scripture. We have a most sacred, solemn truth to bear to the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life, John 3, 16. And then she continues, the Lord Jesus Christ gave up his high command and clothed his divinity with humanity that he might stand at the head of the human race to save to the uttermost all who will receive him as their savior. We may cast, not some, we may cast all our care upon him, For he has plainly shown that he cares for each and every one of us. So Jesus took on humanity to be tempted like we are tempted and to suffer like we suffer. And in doing so, he is able to help those. He's able to help each one of us, you and me, who are tempted. And Jesus just doesn't sympathize with us. He actually empathizes with us because he was tempted in all ways, as stated in Hebrews 4.15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. So Jesus loves us. He fights for us. He represents us against the sinful temptations and the accusations by the enemy. So remember too that Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit, they act in one accord. They don't act on their own. They act in one accord because why? They are one and they love us. It's that simple. What the Father did for Jesus by exalting him at his right hand on his throne, Jesus also wants to do the same thing for us, to sit with him on his throne. If we look at Revelation 3.21, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So in just wrapping this up, God's message to us through Jesus includes not only what Jesus said, but also what the father did through him for our temporal and our eternal benefit. Because God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they love us. It's that simple. And this selfless, deep love that they have for us, for all creation, is evidence not only to us here, but it's also evidence to all the heavenly host about the true and eternal character of God that Lucifer or Satan tried to malign first in heaven and continues to do so here on earth today. God's true character is made manifest by his love for all humanity, fallen and sinful humanity, that despite this condition, God the Father wants to reconcile us to him by speaking to us through his only begotten Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What an amazing God we have. So I'll Amen. Turn it back beautiful, to beautiful. You, Thank you, Mary and Greg. I mean, it was beautifully and succinctly 
pulled together from the scriptures and we can see, I mean, what did Jesus do after he was resurrected? He explained the truth about himself from the scriptures and that's exactly what Paul is doing for the Jewish believers and for those of us that study the Bible. It makes it so much more powerful and Bible strongly based. Amen. So moving right along on Tuesday, he is the radiance of the glory of God. I was going to read again Hebrews 1, 1 through 4, but I'm not going to. I'm going to skip to exactly what Tuesday is about, which is just verse 3. So we're looking at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. So in the middle of this verses that we've been reading, it says, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. And we're talking about Jesus being the brightness of his glory, or in other uh, translations, the radiance of the glory of God. So we're going to have to unpack this one little verse has so much information in it that's going to take us a whole, uh, a whole day of, of, of study. So let's begin. The first part, um, and what we're going to do is we're going to break down the words. First of all, the first word that pops out to us is the word being. In Greek, said on, an expression denoted eternal, timeless existence. So it's not just the word that we think of it. It's, it has much more meaning to it. And it's similarly used in Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. So let's see how it's used in Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him, which capital H, which is God, who is on, it's the same, who is, or the verse on, it's a, the same eternal kind of meaning, and who was, E-N in Greek, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. So it's another point where it's describing uh, Christ, because we know that it's talking about Christ in Revelation. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And it's talking about him enthroned, and he is as an eternal being, and he was, and he is going to be. And then another place where we find a, the same verse is uh, the same meaning is in John 1.1, 1, 1, where it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So we're talking about this eternal presence of Jesus. It wasn't that he was created. He already was in existence. God, Christ did not come in existence in the beginning. In the beginning, he already was. And he came to this world. He, he that what already was came to this world and became flesh. So he didn't get created when he came to this world. That's another thing we need to remember. He had not been previously been in flesh, but he had become flesh. So let's look also at John 1, 14. Uh, continuing, you know, we read John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And now we're skipping down in the same chapter where it says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we already see his preexistence. It is su summarized in that one word, being, uh, who being the brightness of his glory, so being forever, being the brightness of his glory. And then we're going on to the next word, brightness. He being the brightness, in, and brightness in Greek is apagasma. I hope I say it okay. It means outshining, outraying, reflection, radiance. The Father and the Son are inseparable. The Son reveals the Father. He is the outshining of the Father. As when you look at the Son, have you ever tried to look at the Son? It's like, I have. <laughs> and, uh, and you can't really see the Son. All you see is that light that comes at you and blinding. After a while, you can't see anything anymore. You're just kind of like going, oh, what's happening to me? <laughs> I'm going blind. <laughs> We see not the sun itself, but we see its rays. It's the same idea. So we do not see the Father. 
but we see the Son, which is the rays from the Father, himself, the Father himself being invisible, dwelling in the light which no man can approach, the Bible tells us. So let's look at uh, 1 Timothy 6.16, which out, kind of outlines the same idea. It says, in 1 Timothy 6.16, it says, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, and whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. It's talking about God. And then let's continue. The next words in this one little phrase that we're studying is glory of God. So it, the statement says he is the radiance or brightness of the glory of God. The glory of God is the total sum of God's attributes. Uh, in Exodus, Moses asked God, I beseech thee, show me your glory. That's in Exodus 33:18. And in response to that appeal, God said in the very next verse, in verse 19, so Exodus 33, 19, God said, then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. So Moses says, let me see you, let me see your glory. And he says, okay, I will make my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I'll be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. So he's basically saying, okay, I hear you. You want to see my glory. This is what I'm going to pass before you. So it's like the glory of God is these characteristics of God. And then he actually executes on the promise in the next chapter of Exodus. So in review... Moses said, let me see your glory. God said, I'm going to pass these characteristics of mine before you so you can see my glory. And then he executes in chapter 34, verses 5 to 7, and it says, Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So we can see very clearly from these texts that the glory of God is his character attributes. So God's glory is his character. Important to note in the original text in Hebrews 1 to 3, it says, Christ did, what we want to note in that uh, is that Christ did not become the brightness of God's glory. He already was and always has been. The text states he is the radiance of the glory of God. Express image is the next word in our uh, phrase, or exact imprint. Uh, in Greek, it's called character. Similar to the word seal, like you, when you make a seal, you it has the same meaning of creating the seal, the one that you actually place on the document, or forming the seal. So it's imprint in both actual being the imprint and creating the imprint. Person is the next word in our phrase, being the expressed image of his person. Literally means that which stands under, the essence, actual being, reality. It signifies that he is the exact image imprint of the person, of the actual, it's like he's the essence of God. So when Christ is said to be the express image of the Father, it means more than outward likeness. He is the exact and true expression of the very inmost nature of God. As is the Father, so is the Son, one in essence, one in character, one in mind and purpose. So alike are they that Christ could say as he did in John 14, 9. Jesus said to his disciples, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me? Philip to Philip. He who has seen me has seen the Father, so how can you say, show us the Father? And also in John 10, 30, he said, I and my Father are one. So we have already seen uh, that he is an express interpretation. I'm going to kind of paraphrase a little bit with the things that we've just studied and wrap up with that. So in Hebrews, in that verse, it said, or starting right before, it says, he has appointed heir of all things, through whom all he has, he made the worlds, who being 
from eternity to eternity, the brightness, the outshining of the Father, the radiance of the Father's character, of his glory, and the exact actual expressed image or extension of his essence, and upholding all things by the world of his power. So we can kind of see how much is written in this one little sentence. It's a lot to ponder. I'm going, we're going to move right along to Wednesdays because we have a lot to cover in every day and it's all very meaningful. Yes, and now we're going to continue studying what um, the promised son was going to be and as the title says, through whom he made the universe. So according to Hebrews 1-2, which we've already read, through whom did God also make the universe? Jesus. Paul affirms that God created the world through or by Jesus and that Jesus sustains the world with his powerful word. So let's read some Old Testament verses regarding the creator starting with Isaiah 44 24 and that reads thus says the Lord your redeemer and he who formed you from the womb I am the Lord who makes all things who stretches out the heavens all alone who spreads abroad the earth by myself then Isaiah 45 18 says for thus says the Lord who created the heavens who is God who formed the earth and made it who has established it who did not create it in vain who formed it to be inhabited I am the Lord and there is no other and then Nehemiah 9 6 you alone are the Lord you have made heaven the heaven of heavens with all their host the earth and everything on it the sea and all that is in them and you preserve them all the host of heaven worships you so in these Old Testament verses, God is affirming that he alone created the world and he is the only God. How do you reconcile this with the New Testament verses that God created the universe through Jesus? Well, let's first be clear that Jesus wasn't only an instrument through whom God created. Paul states that Jesus created the world in Hebrews 1.10. You, Lord, that's Jesus, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Now, this is God the Father speaking to Jesus, his son. And in verses 10 to 12, Paul is actually quoting Psalms 102, 25 to 27, that says, And of old you laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands they will perish but you will endure yes they will all grow old like a garment like a cloak you will change them and they will be changed but you are the same and your years will have no end so Paul applies to Jesus what King David said about the Lord as creator Hebrews 2 10 reads for it was fitting for him meaning God the Father, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation, that's Jesus, perfect through suffering. So here Paul is saying that the universe was created by the Father as well. So who was involved in the creation? The Father and the Son. There is a perfect agreement between the two of them in purpose and activity. There's only one creator God, and this is the mystery of the Godhead, which implies that not only is the Father God, but Jesus the Son is also God. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 34, we read, the sovereign of the universe was not alone in his work of beneficence. That's God the Father. He had an associate, a co-worker, who could appreciate his purposes and could share his joy in giving happiness to created beings. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. John 1, 1 and 2. Christ, the Word, the begotten of God, was one with the eternal father one in nature in character in purposes 
the only being that could enter into all the counsel and purposes of God. And Ellen White goes on to state that the Father wrought, which is an old English word for performed, effected, or produced. So the Father produced by his Son in the creation of all heavenly beings. And she quotes Colossians 1.10. So in addition to being God, Paul also tells us that Jesus is the one in whom we must give account. In other words, he's our judge. Hebrews 4.13 says, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him, that's Jesus, to whom we must give account. And why is he judge? Because his authority to rule and judge derives from the fact that he created all things and sustains them. Paul also reiterates that Jesus sustains the universe in Hebrews 1, 3, and it was read earlier too, and upholding all things by the word of his power. And in Colossians 1, 17, it says, and in him all things consist. So in summary, every breath, every heartbeat, and every moment of our existence is found in him, Jesus, the foundation of all created existence. As Paul said to the Athenians in Acts 17, 28, for in him we live and move and have our being. And with that, I'll Amen. hand it over to awesome. Greg. Thank you. Well, thank you. You did such a great job in coming under time for your day. Can I borrow from your <laughs> surplus? Because we're going to need it. We have quite a bit of scripture to go through, and I'm going to do my very, very best to get through it because um, Thursday's lesson was really significant and important for me, especially years ago as I thought about what the lesson is about. Thursday's lesson is entitled, Today I Have Begotten You. So again, let's take a look at our Bibles. Let's open up to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5 this time. We've read 1 through 4 a couple times now. But verse 5, this is just a continuation that Paul is talking about. And so Paul is saying, he's saying to, to the Jews, for to which of the angels did he, God, ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. So, you are my son, today I have begotten you. So, begotten in the Greek is the word geneo. And geneo, depending on the context, can mean anything from born to kindred to offspring, stock, tribe, or nation. And it can also mean of the same nature, appointed, delivered, caused to arise, to bring forth. And in the Greek, if we look at John 3, 16, the word begotten is mon monogenous. So you always think of monogamous, but monogenous, meaning single of its kind. So was God saying that at some time, time in the long distant past that he created Jesus? Well, no, that's not what the context says in scripture. The context of what is stated is God simply is saying to us that Jesus is the only one, the appointed one, the expressed image of himself, which we have already covered, the same nature. Jesus is not an angel. Jesus is above the angels because he created the angels. And God the Father appointed Jesus to create all things through him, through Jesus. And Mary went through that in, in quite detail. But proof of this, of what we're talking about here, and proof that Jesus was always with the Father, is found in John 1, verses 1 through 4. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So getting back to the term begotten. Jesus was begotten in the sense that he was installed, he was adopted, he was chosen, he was designated, he was appointed. 
he was brought forth as the promised ruler through the seed of the son of David. Psalm chapter 2 verses 7 through 8. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. And then again in 2 Samuel 2, I'm sorry, 2 Samuel chapter 7 verses 12 through 14. We read this earlier, but let's read this again because again it has a dual purpose and we covered it, but we go through so much information. If we repeat, it sometimes helps to cement um, the, the principal concepts that are being conveyed here. So 2 Samuel chapter 7, 12 through 14. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your father. So who, who is, who's talking here? Is God talking to Jesus? Is he talking to David? Is he talking, who is he talking to? Who is he referring to? When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, he's talking about, he's talking to David that when his days are fulfilled, and he rests with his fathers. I will set up your seed after you. So he's talking about Solomon, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. Because remember, David didn't build the temple for God. Solomon did. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Did Solomon's kingdom last forever? Not directly. But prophetically, it's talking about Jesus being the ultimate fulfillment of this prophecy. I will be his father and he shall be my son. And he goes on to continue. And we know that he's talking to David here. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. So again, he's talking to David, but he's also talking about the fulfillment of Jesus Christ here. And the fulfillment, we look at Luke chapter 1, verses 31 through 33. And behold, you... And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and he shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. So he, that's proof that he's coming from the seed of David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. So God fulfilled his promise to David that through his seed, God's son, Jesus, would be adopted, he would be appointed, he would be established as his own son, and his throne over the nations would be established forever. So the covenant is fulfilled in that Jesus is the Messiah, the only begotten son of God. Jesus is the only begotten, again, meaning of the same nature that he is the appointed one, the designated one, to fulfill God's plan of salvation. And Mary, I believe, had read earlier in Isaiah 9, 6. Or was it Daniel? That, um, let me read that. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. Matthew 1:23. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. And Paul also tells us in Hebrews 7.3 that Jesus has neither a beginning of days or end of life. And he tells us this in Hebrews 7.3, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continuously. And in Hebrews 13, 8, Paul tells us, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the term begotting begetting of Jesus refers to the appointment and the fulfillment in Jesus' prophetic role in fulfilling the covenant that was established to rule over the nations and that his kingdom would be everlasting. So again, in the context of Scripture, Jesus being begotten does not refer to the beginning of his existence because Jesus has always existed. He existed prior to coming to earth when he was in heaven with the Father. Also, in his descent to earth, he was still God. And when he descended 
into heaven. And when he descended into heaven, he is serving again as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. So according to scripture, there is never a time that Jesus did not exist because he is God. He is part of the Godhead. And I know this is a little challenging sometimes for our carnal minds to, to wrap around this, but we need to rely on Scripture to define itself and not to rest upon our own presumptions or assumptions. So in just wrapping this up and in conclusion, the idea that Jesus as God's only begotten Son is referring, is not referring to the creation of Jesus, rather it has to do with the appointment of his role, his responsibility, and his fulfillment. Through his incarnation, Jesus fulfilled all the covenant promises of the plan of salvation. He is the fulfillment. He is the promised one. He is the appointed one. He is the anointed one in God's plan of salvation. He is the only begotten Son of God. And so now I'll turn it back. Thank, thank you. Um, how much ground we covered yes. in one chapter there is just so much when we're looking at hebrews chapter one it is like jam-packed with information um so i would like to do a quick summary as we're closing um by looking at this chapter one in its entire we realize that in just a short chapter there's a lot of concepts which are necessary um, as believers to have a solid theology a solid theology lies at the foundation of a good Christian life. Um, if we are confused about the nature of Christ, his purpose, his status, uh, and the plan of salvation, how could we stand and not be deceived as we've been warned that we would be, uh, there will be an attempt to deceive, there are many attempts of deceiving us. We couldn't even understand the heart of God or the incredible love that is in his heart for us if we couldn't understand that he made the ultimate sacrifice and came down as God. Jesus came down from being God and became flesh and suffered the humility that even for us to put ourselves in those steps and imagine ourselves going through the steps that Jesus went and through the sufferings that he went, it's almost inconceivable for us to do. But to think that he gave up his godly position to do that so the concept, some of the concepts that are revealed in Hebrews, let's review them very briefly. God is one, Father and Son are one, from eternity to eternity. Jesus is equal to the Father. Jesus existed from eternity to eternity. Jesus is the radiance of the Father and an exact and actual expression of the Father's character, of his essence, and he is upholding all things by the word of his own power. Jesus had by himself purged the sins of the world and is enthroned at the right hand of God on high. He is and always was above the angels. Jesus came to this world for the sole purpose of saving us. He came to replace us in the fight and defeat the serpent, Satan. Amen. Our inheritance has been restored at the second coming which is our blessed hope, as the scripture calls it, we will be fully restored to what we were intended to be like if sin would have never existed. Looking forward to that. Amen. 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 Thank you for being with us today in this incredible study that we've had, and we're looking forward to the rest of the quarter in Hebrews. But as we are... Uh, Wishing you a happy Sabbath. We'd like to close with a word of prayer. So Mary, would you uh, Definitely. say a word of prayer for us? Our Heavenly Father, we're so very grateful for the Sabbath day and for the opportunity to open this wonderful, powerful book of Hebrews. Thank you for the promised Son. And thank you for all the promises that you have fulfilled through him for us. And I pray that as we continue studying your word, our love for you and for others will deepen, and that we'll be prepared for that second coming, the blessed hope that we're looking forward to so soon. Please bless us and all of those who have joined us today throughout the rest of this day, your Sabbath day, and through the week. May we be a blessing to others, and may we honor and glorify you in all that we think, say, and do. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. 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 Well, a happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. And join our studies next week.